Today we begin a series on the Ten Commandments. I love the story about the Baptist Sunday School teacher who was trying to teach the Ten Commandments to her students. She thought it would be helpful if she read some concrete illustrations. She asked the class to tell which commandment each story related to. The first one started early one Saturday morning. Johnny's parents were going shopping. They asked Johnny to wash the dishes while they were gone. When they returned, however, Johnny was watching the cartoons and he had not washed the dishes. Altogether, the class responded, honor thy father and thy mother. Good, said the teacher. Then she read, Anne went shopping with her mother. When no one was looking, she slipped a candy bar into her pocket. Again, the class was quick. Thou shalt not steal. Great, said the teacher. She started the third illustration. Andy was a cruel little boy and he had a bad temper. He got angry with his little sister one day. He grabbed her kitten. He threatened to pull its tail off. Now this was a much harder and, and tougher example. Everyone was really quiet. This one little guy brightened up then and shouted, what God has joined together, let no one put asunder. In another Sunday school class, Nancy Burns of Charlotte, North Carolina, tells about teaching a class of five-year-olds. She asked if anybody could tell where to find the Ten Commandments. There was silence. After a few moments, a freckle-faced kid said very seriously, have you Googled it? Are these 3,500-year-old commandments from the Middle East relevant, relevant for us in America today? 250 years ago, James Madison, the father of the American Constitution, said this, we have staked the whole future of American civilization not upon the power of government, far from it. We have staked the future upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves, to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. We will see that the Ten Commandments are still as relevant today as they were when Moses brought them down the mountain or when the U.S. Constitution was written. I took the five-year-old's advice and Googled the Ten Commandments. Of course, ads always come up first. I saw lots of different advertisements for plaques and posters of the Ten Commandments. None of them had the prologue, the first two verses of our chapter. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Instead, they started with what we Christians label as the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Leaving out the prologue is completely wrong. Why? It removes them from their context. These 10 commandments were given by the God who had delivered the people out of slavery and brought them to the mountain in the desert. God is establishing a new covenant with this group of people if they are willing. God has already shown what God will do for them. The Lord had defeated the gods of Egypt by bringing the 10 plagues upon the Egyptians who had been oppressing the Israelites. He delivered the Israelites from the enemy army by making a path for them through the sea Nine-year-old Joey was asked by his mother what he had learned in Sunday school. Well, Mom, our teacher told us how God sent Moses behind enemy lines on a rescue mission to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. When, he got to the, when they got to the Red Sea, Moses had his army build a pontoon bridge, and all the people walked across safely. But the Egyptian army followed them on the bridge. Then Moses radioed headquarters for an airstrike. They sent bombers to blow up the bridge and all the Egyptians died, but the Israelites escaped. Now, Joey, is that really how your teacher taught you? His mother asked. Well, no, mom, but if I told it the way the teacher did, you'd never believe it. By hearing the cries of the people and delivering them from slavery, God has revealed his love for the people and his choice of Israel as his own special people. By leaving out the first words, many people misunderstand the Ten Commandments. It simply becomes a list of do's and don'ts. The truth is, it's all about our relationship with this God 
who has done marvelous things for the people. God is inviting the Israelites into a covenant relationship. What is a covenant? A covenant is not a legal or business contract with stipulations between parties. A covenant goes deeper than that. Probably the covenant relationship that most of us are familiar with is marriage. It's a mutual commitment to each other. This is what God is offering the people of Israel. In other words, if you enter this covenant, then this is what you agree to do. Like in a marriage ceremony, a bride and groom say to each other that they will love, honor, and cherish each other as they enter into the marriage. So for each of these commandments, we need to hear God saying, this is how much I have loved you. If you're willing to love me, you will do this or not do that. For example, I have shown my love for you by delivering you out of Egypt, out of slavery. If you will love me, you will have no other gods before me. If they agree, their relationship with God becomes their first priority. God wants an exclusive relationship with the people similar to a marriage covenant. When the couple says that they will keep themselves faithfully only to their spouse as long as they both shall live, it's an exclusive relationship. Are the Ten Commandments relevant for Christians? We Christians have a different covenant with God based on Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus said to his disciples at the Last Supper, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Did Jesus teach this command to have no other gods than the one true God? Jesus taught the principle of putting God first more than any of the other nine commandments. In our passage, the Pharisees set a trap for Jesus by having an expert in the Torah ask Jesus a question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? He replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Jesus teaches that this first commandment is more important than all the other commandments. For example, Jesus said the second greatest commandment is you must love your neighbor as yourself. This commandment is not as important as the first. We are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, but we're to love God more than we love ourselves. For example, Jesus said, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up the cross daily and follow me. Taking up one's cross means to be willing to die, to be executed for the Lord's sake. Jesus further said, all who want to save their lives will lose them, but all who lose their lives because of me will find them. We are to love our neighbors. The most important of all our neighbors are our families. Yet Jesus said, those who love father or mother more than me aren't worthy of me. Those who love son or daughter more than me aren't worthy of me. God is our first priority, our first love. Jesus showed the world how much God loves us. Our response is to love God in return. Some people reject the love of God. My assumption is that those of you who are listening to this have accepted God's love in your life. You've agreed to enter this covenant relationship with God. So the first commandment, to have no other gods before this one true God who has loved us, is just as applicable today in the 21st century as it was 3,500 years ago. So how do we love God? Let's return to our analogy of marriage. How do you love your husband? How do you love your wife? Because you love them, you want to spend time with them. You want to give them gifts. You do things that are important to them. You share common interests and values. You want to help them in any way that they might need help. You serve them by putting their needs ahead of your own. It's similar with God. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus recommended that we not worry about such things as food and clothing, but he encouraged us, strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. 
He suggests that seeking God is the first key to a worry-free life. Because God has shown his love for us in Jesus Christ and in countless other ways, we can trust that the Lord will take care of us and provide for us. Putting God first is not a hardship, rather it is just the opposite. We do not put God first in order to please God or that, so that God will accept us. God has already accepted us and has already loved us. So we put God first because God has first loved us. The Ten Commandments are not given for God's sake, but for ours. In Deuteronomy, Moses says, Now Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? Only this, to revere the Lord your God by walking in all his ways, by loving him, by serving the Lord your God with all your heart and being, and by keeping the Lord's commandments and his regulations that I am commanding you right now. It's for your own good. That's what we have to remember about all the commandments. Keeping them is for our own good. One of the ways that we misunderstand the Ten Commandments is that we think they, these are imposed on us as restrictions limiting our freedom. Two men in a truck, neither one very bright, were passing through a small town. They came to an overpass with a sign which read, clearance, 11 feet, three inches. They got out and measured their rig. It measured 12 feet, four inches tall. As they climbed back into the cab, one of them asked, what do you think we should do? The driver looked around, then shifted into gear saying, not a cop in sight, let's take a chance. Some people had the same attitude toward God and the Ten Commandments. They visualized God as the great cop in the sky whose laws are designed to cramp our style and cheat us out of some good times. So if they can beat the rap, they try. The opposite is really the case. The Ten Commandments are God's guidelines toward the good life and the possibility of a good community. Our wise and loving God gave them to us to protect us from harm and direct us toward the most fulfilling way of life. Common sense makes that obvious. If you commit adultery, what are the probable outcomes of that? Causing heartache for others and for yourself or worse? If you steal, will that turn out good for you? If in your anger you take someone else's life, is that going to be good for you? And if you don't honor your parents, you may be left out of their wills. A husband and wife were discussing the possibility of taking a trip to the Holy Land. And the husband said, honey, wouldn't it be fantastic to go up into, to go up on Mount Sinai and shout out the Ten Commandments? She said, I think it would be better if we just stayed home and kept them. Of all of the Lord's commands, this is the most difficult to keep. Why? Because we have to step down from the throne and allow God to have top priority. In fact, this is the first temptation of the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. The serpent said, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Keeping this command is not something we can do once and for all. It's a daily taking up our cross and following the Lord. Our lives will be so much better if we keep this command. God loves us more than we can imagine. If we put God first, only good can come from that. Our lives will not be worse, but much better. We, have, we will have far less fear and anxiety, far more love and compassion. We'll become less self-centered and more willing to love others. We will become less materialistic and more generous. We will become more like our loving and gracious God. Let's pray. God of grace and mercy, help us to humble ourselves and put you first in our lives. Help us to love you the way that you love us. Amen.